No, he's he's pretty. He's not antsy today. Thank you, Tyler. All right. Uh, good morning to all of you. Could you turn in your Bibles to Philemon? Uh, remember, there's one chapter in the book, Philemon, verse 1. It's set right at, you have First and Second Timothy, then you have Titus, and then Philemon. It's right before Hebrews. You went to Hebrews, you went too far. And also in your songbooks, if you could do, go to page 89 in your songbooks. Page 89 in your songbooks, we're going to do Isn't He? And, uh, and you should be in your Bibles at Philemon, verse 1. Just a couple of announcements. We have our... Our Sunday morning offering at the end of class. We have our, our website is www.wenstrom.org. Uh, all of our classes are recorded and videoed and put on. Uh, we have audio video of the classes put on the website. We have, uh, after we've t- done the, after I've taught a particular verse, I end up putting the written materials on that verse on the website. So every one of these books that we've done, whether it's we're doing Daniel, Romans, Genesis, everything we've done in the past is on the website in written form. And not just that, but also the audio and the video. So take advantage of that. And then there's also in our written library different, um, uh, different doctrines in the, in the different categories and theology. So um, you can take advantage of that too. And also, uh, let's see, our class schedule Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 7 to 8. Uh, we have a prayer meeting at the end of class on Thursday. We have our Pal Talk people take part in that. That's awesome. And also, uh, uh, we have, um, during the week, we're doing the book of Daniel, and that's verse-by-verse study of Daniel. We're currently in Daniel chapter 6. We're studying Daniel and his, uh, and Darius, and the, uh, there's a great conspiracy against Daniel in that chapter, so we, it's been a great study thus far. So that's what we're doing during the week. And uh, also, uh, what else? Uh, I think that's about it. We're going to take a moment of silent prayer as we normally do. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to say that yeah, I have to say this because the because uh, when I win, I, I I I chirp, you know. So, but we lost. We had the you know our our pool match. We went over the Bill and Crystal's uh, house the, uh, Friday night. Thank you very much for having us over. It was very gracious of you. I didn't know Bill was such a great cook. I mean that whatever you, the meatball parmesan thing was unbelievable. It was really good. So next time we go there, we'll have to do that again. So that was good. Um, and uh, thank you uh, so much, Tony and I would just like to say we. We were just today able to sit down because our rear ends are so sore. We got spanked. You guys spanked us like, uh, you know, you were our daddy. I mean, he, they killed us in pool, pool. We had a best of seven series. And a lot of times we pull it out, but not this time. We got smoked. I think it was four games to one. And then they won another game. I didn't, I didn't play. It was Tony and uh, your son. What's that? Oh, they, I think that they were, I want to check them. I think they should do blood work. I think they should, I think they should do some blood work on them because I think they were, they were juicing it. They were steroids, you know, <laughs> you know, those guys, I think they were juicing it. We call it, man, I've never seen so many shots going from all these, you know, Titus is going, let me go. You know, how Titus, aerodynamically, and bam, he's knocking them in all over there. Bill's like, you know, behind the back and all that. Sometimes you just don't have it. You know, that's right. They were on fire. You got to tip your hat to them. So at least, you know, you know, um, you know they, they earned it. They beat, they beat us bad. So. so don't anybody say that when we, when, I, when we win that I chirp and then I don't say anything when we lose. I say a lot when I <laughs> unfortunately. So that was a lot of fun. Thank you again, Bill and Crystal, for having us over. All right. Um, and also, gee, I almost forgot. I can't believe I almost forgot. Everybody, we need to uh, wish happy birthday to Tony. Let's, uh, let's sing him happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Sing it. Happy birthday, dear Tony. <laughs> happy birthday to you. And Tony says on Facebook, it says, he's 39. Now, I think we should do a little uh, a birth certificate check on that, like the president, you know. I think we need to b- check the birth certificate, because I think he's a little bit older than that. Aren't you a little older than that? Were you in 1970? I don't know. I can't remember that far back. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was 13. Yeah, because I was born in 61, so that would make me 13. I, November, I don't know, whatever, 12. All right, well, happy birthday. Oh. Watching the Beatles right? broke up by then. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was after the fact. I became a fan after. All right, um, let's see. I think that's it. So let's take a moment of silent prayer. Let's prepare ourselves to uh, worship God. To do that, we need to worship God in spirit and truth, as the Lord taught the woman at the well and Samaritan woman in John 4, uh, that uh, in order for us to be in fellowship with God, if we're not already, we need to confess our sins. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we, there's any sin we need to uh, confess. Once we've done that, as 1 John 1, 9 states, if we confess our sins to the Father, he, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, 
with the result that he purifies us from each and every wrongdoing, even the sins that we don't uh, know that we're committing due to ignorance of the word of God. Once you've done that, you stay in fellowship simply by obeying what the Spirit is saying to us in the word of God. That's when you're fill, filled with the Spirit commanded of us in Ephesians 5.18. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, uh, like Tony and I, we, you know, the loss is, was a crushing loss, so we're going to have to, uh, you know, we have to cast our anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for us. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can gather together with each other as members of the body of Christ and to worship you through the study of your almighty word. We thank you so much, Father, for everyone that is here this morning bringing us all together. We thank you for those not only in the Thompson household but uh, those that are our are, are brothers and sisters in Christ on Pal Talk and who are watching this class uh, through the uh, internet radio or TeamSpeak or the website. We thank you for every single one of them. We thank you for... The Thompsons opening up their home to us so that we could teach the Word of God here on a daily basis. We thank you, Father, for the technology that you've given us so that we can communicate the gospel throughout the world. We thank you for Titus and Tyler's work with the recordings. We pray that we'd have no problems with the technology uh, this morning. We just thank you for the sunshine, and we just thank you for um, the the snow that you've given us recently, the moisture. We have a, a bad drought, obviously, so we just thank you for the moisture that you've given us. And we also, we thank you for the logistical grace blessings that you give to us on a daily basis. The food, shelter, the clothing, the homes that we live in, the heat that we need in the winter, the air conditioning in the summer, and the jobs and businesses that we have, the salaries that we have, the children that we have, uh, the wives, the husbands, and uh, we thank you for the church that you've given us, the word of God, and our fellowship with other believers. And we just thank you for placing us in union with your son, Jesus Christ, and seating us at your right hand through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, and the baptism of the Spirit. We thank you for the fact that we received the forgiveness of our sins, and we're now your children, sons of God, and now your responsibility, and that uh, we know that uh, you care for us, and you provide for us, and we thank you not only for uh, the things that we take for granted, the, the logistical grace blessings for d each day, but we also thank you for the adversity, as well as the, not just the prosperity in our lives. We thank you for the adversities that we go through from time to time because they draw us closer to you and help us to see the, the value of our relationship and fellowship with you. Uh, we lift up the people in this area uh, that, uh, that might not be believers. We pray that you would bring in whatever circumstances, people, blessings, adversity, prosperity necessary to show, that, that, to show them their need for the Savior, Jesus Christ. And for those believers who are going in the wrong direction, we just pray that you would call them back, do whatever it takes to show them that their need for the Word of God and to fellowship with the body of Christ and fellowship in a local church. And if you see fit, we pray that you would raise up positive volition in this ministry and other ministries throughout this country and the world that are faithful to the teaching of the Word of God. We pray this morning that this would be a great class for everyone, that it would build up and edify the body of Christ, give us insight uh, into your word through the ministry of the Spirit. We pray that you would bless us in the study of Philemon this morning. And uh, we also pray that you would uh, not only help the audience to concentrate and to apply what's being taught accurately, but also empower myself to deliver your full counsel to your people so that they are built up and edified spiritually and you and your son are magnified and people praise your son, Father, and yourself. We pray that the Spirit would also not only help us to learn the word and teach the word, but also to sing and to give and to fellowship with each other as we uh, worship you today, this morning. So, Father, we pray for these people and things. And our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. All right, could you all rise, please? And page 89 in your songbooks is where you should be, isn't he?
two of our best singers are not here, so we have to cover for them. We have to make up for what we're lacking without them here. song I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to do um, the gospel, and that's on page, Let's see if I can find it, yeah, 157, Shane, can I use, I need another songbook for this one, because it goes in the the back. I write too many lyrics. <laughs> hey, this next one's called The Gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel Cause it's the power of God to save Revealing God Speaks of his love, giving life to raise men from the grave. Everyone is a sinner, is not righteous, no, not one. Everyone needs a savior. God's gift of life is in his son, yeah. All right. Every man, woman, and child, you gotta give them the gospel. Black and white, rich and poor. 
give them the gospel. You demonstrate the love of God when you give them the gospel. I'm giving the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For a righteous God, it reveals faith to faith. It sanctifies, teaching the truth and wounded hearts it heals. I won't listen to Oprah when I can open the word. And Dr. Phil cannot help me. Only every word from the mouth of God, yeah. All right. Every man, woman, and child, you gotta give them a gospel. Black and white, rich and poor, give them a gospel. You demonstrate the love of God when you give them a gospel. The world can't host social problems by looking to itself. All it needs is Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The wisdom of man can't compare. The wisdom of God is Christ crucified. The power of God to those now in his care. The devil spreads his wicked lies, deceiving the hearts of a man. Only the truth of the gospel can set men free and make them whole, yeah. All right, every man, woman, and child, you gotta give them the gospel. Black and white, rich and poor, give them the gospel. You demonstrate the love of God when you give them the gospel. No sex, drugs, or alcohol can take the place of a loving God. All you need is Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life for every man, woman, and child. You gotta give them the gospel. Black and white, rich and poor, give them the gospel. You demonstrate the love of God when you give them the gospel. Oh, give them the gospel. Oh, give them the gospel. Hey, thanks, Cheyenne, for that. You can take this back if you want. Thank you. All right, you should be at Philemon chapter 1, verse 1. There's only one chapter, of course. <laughs> and uh, I, I play that song, the gospel, because uh, that's exactly what Paul in the early first century apostolic church did. They just spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. And the reason why is it was the power of God for salvation. Uh, what the book of Philemon is going to uh, tell us, it's going to show in how the gospel applies practically in everyday life. Uh, we live in a world with tons of social problems, economic problems, um, political problems, all over the place, problems in families, and the solution to the problem is the gospel. Because the, go the problem that we all have in all these areas, social, economic, political, in our families, it all stems from the fact that we're sinners and we're in the devil's world and the only solution to that problem is the gospel because the gospel is the power of salvation. Salvation meaning the gospel, when we respond to it, it deliver us, delivers us from the power of sin and Satan. At the moment of our conversion, when we trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, we received that deliverance. Now, after our conversion, we need to walk by faith in what the Word of God says and appropriate that deliverance, experience that deliverance now in time. The re we already have the victory. So the solution to the problems of, of the world today is not a political solution or some new social problem or a new law or, or, or anything like that. We need something that's called the gospel because the gospel will solve our problems. And this is where we have a choice to make as Christians. Do we believe, as pastors too, very important. Do we believe that? Do we believe that that can solve our problems? Uh, do, we need, do we think that psychology, uh, do we think that medicine is going to so, so, so solve our problems? If we could only get rid of cancer, if we could only uh, get a pill that would take care of this problem or that problem, we don't, in many ways, we show that we don't have any faith 
in the gospel. And it's by our, our, our attitude toward it. When we go, face problems in life, do we turn to God? Do we turn to God's, the gospel? Or do we turn to uh, man-made solutions? Man-made uh, solutions to, to problems that men can't solve. Like John Kennedy said years ago, uh, he said that the problems of man are man, the problems of the world are man-made and therefore can only be, can be solved by man. I don't believe that. Of course not. The problems are deeper than man-made. They're made by Satan too. They're supernatural. Uh, we need the gospel. Now Paul took the gospel in this epistle, this tiny little epistle, which is overlooked in many parts uh, of Christianity throughout the centuries. He takes this, God, this, this little epistle. It tells us how Paul applied practically applied this gospel in his daily life, in his walk with God. He has, a, he, has a, he has a problem with a slave, Christian slave owner, and a Christian slave, a slave who actually gets saved through his ministry. So now he's going to be the intermediary between the two. What we're going to find out in this book is that, uh, which was dealing with a problem called slavery. Now, Paul doesn't call for the abolition of slavery. We're going to talk about this even more next week, Paul's attitude towards slavery. Uh, uh, slavery, he didn't call for it to be abolished. Uh, what he actually did is he called for the gospel to be proclaimed because it was the gospel, and it, they did this, and within a couple of centuries, slavery was gone from the Roman Empire without a shot being fired. Now, our country, uh, our country in the 1800s, uh, what they did, and we have a lot of, and the abolition movement in our, in our country started in the north with pastors. And they, missed, they didn't understand this. They thought that they, they had to politically remove slavery. It could have been done through the gospel if they just preached the gospel. Instead, how many people get killed? And you can go all the way into the 1960s, 100 years after the Civil War, they're still shooting each other over it. And they tried to force the issue, uh, they tried to force the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the removal of this institution, slavery, from American life, and it ended up in bloodshed. It could have been removed without a shot fired if they followed what the apostles did and, pro and the early Christians did, proclaim the gospel because it, you have to change the hearts of the people. But that's what they did in Rome. And then eventually the slave owners were just, they were manumitting their slaves, freeing their slaves, and without a shot being fired, without a law being passed, now without an emancipation proclamation. And it, and it, all, it all started with pastors in the north. Yeah, that's where it really got going, is the abolition movement. Now, when you, this is where instance where you and I in the 21st century cannot take our views of slavery, which we've got from school, uh, and slavery of, the, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of America, the new world slavery, they call it. You can't take that, your, your, what you know of that, and apply it into this book in the first century, Philemon. Slavery in the Roman Empire was a lot different. Slaves were a lot, the whole, whole institution of slavery in Rome is totally different than the New World slavery that America had in the, in the 1700s, 1800s, you know, and before that. So it's not the same. They're totally different. And let me give you some reasons why. Because we're going to talk about the subject of slavery here, but you, need, you, not, you and I need to be educated on what slavery was in the first century and it was not the slavery that you had in our country in the 18, you know, when, when we had, which, which was uh, resulted in the Civil War. So uh, what are some of the differences between ancient slavery, like slavery in the Roman Empire, and in Israel, and in Greece, in the ancient world, and also slavery in, our, in, in not too recent times in America? What's the differences? Well, first of all, the appearance of slaves they looked no different in the first century. Onesimus would look no different than any other person. There wasn't this certain clothing that they wore. In fact, in Roman Empire, the slaves outnumbered the free men. So they didn't dress differently from each other. Also, uh, they shared, slaves and slave owners in the first century shared the same traditions. They same, shared the same religions as well. And also, it's interesting, they encouraged education. They encouraged education. In fact, a lot of the people who were slaves in the, first in the first century, a lot of them were called household slaves. They were professional people. They were doctors. They were lawyers. Uh, there's a case where you see in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 23, verses uh, chapter 23 all the way through chapter 25, the case of Paul before a man named Felix. Well, Marcus Antonius Felix was a, uh, Felix was a slave, and he became... 
a ruler. So he was, uh, slave, uh, the slaves in the first century, uh, like for instance Rome, they conquered many nations and they made slaves of people, but they didn't, it wasn't like they put them on a chain gang. Not everybody was uh, in the gladiatorial schools or, those, or out in the fields, which you saw in this American South, the blacks, most, a lot of the majority of them were out in the field picking cotton or doing something like that, field farm hands and all that. I mean, there were household slaves, I know that. But in Rome, they had professional people. They had doctors. They, they were, if they were from Greece, uh, they were, if they were a doctor in Greece, well, they were do a doctor in the Roman Empire. They maintained that. And their slave masters would utilize that. They were accountants. They were professional people, many of them. And so they were, uh, uh, they were, uh, uh, so they had, there were many t cases, these slaves in the first century were very educated, very well educated. The other thing is, they could own property. American slaves didn't. But you could in the Roman Empire. You could, and you could, and you could be freed. You could, you could uh, save up money to, be, to get your freedom, and uh, uh, you could, be, uh, or some, you could, write, you could uh, work it out with your master where he could end up freeing you. Like in Israel, every six years, you had to free uh, people from slavery. The other thing is, in the ancient world, people went into slavery to handle debt. Like you hear all the debt crisis in our country with all the uh, people getting problems with bankruptcy and everything. Well, in the ancient world, you didn't declare bankruptcy. What you did is you ended up being a slave and paying off your debt to people. Now, so slavery in the ancient world in the first century was voluntarily many times. You know, it's also interesting, and that's, that's not like a slavery in the American South, okay? So I'm bringing, pointing out these distinctions and differences, and they're fundamentally different from slavery in, in America uh, in recent history than the ancient world. It's totally fundamentally different from each other. Also, uh, what we saw is that um, slavery, you could, it was, slavery in the ancient world could be, was voluntar voluntary, uh, voluntarily uh, done, taken on. And so this is something that you could be very, uh, it, being a slave, uh, you could own property, as I said before, and also is that you weren't conscious, and this is a very key thing, you weren't conscious, if you were a slave in the first century, you weren't conscious that you were like this social class that was destitute. They weren't always destitute. You could have your own money. See, there's a totally different attitude between uh, slavery, a uh, totally fun fundamental change, uh, differences between slavery in America and slavery in Paul's day. So Paul, if you ask the guy in the first century if slavery was a big problem, most people would say no. Most people would say no. Now, what happened was, eventually, uh, what happened, and the gospel contributed to this, many people, uh, they, would, uh, they, would release this, they would release slaves. They would release the slaves. And the other thing is, they, they call it manumitting the slave. But what's also interesting is a lot of times, the slaves, and you know, yes, there were cases where people, many cases where slaves were mistreated. Those were usually the, the guys out in, the, the, out in the field or do, who didn't have any professional skills. They were mistreated, but many times, and this was true in the American South as well, but it was definitely in the ancient world in Paul's day, many of them were very great, became, uh, you know, some people married their slaves. Some people, their best friends were their slaves. So uh, it was a totally different attitude in the ancient world. It was a big institution. God actually, in, in Israel, told uh, Israel to make slaves of those they conquered in war, and they did. So they did, but the difference with in Israel, if you made a slave of somebody, they, had, they were allowed to observe the Sabbath with you, Passover, the festivals, and we saw that in the book of Exodus. But also in the year of Jubilee, every 50 years, everybody was freed. Um, they, free, they released debts. Here's a, here's, a, here's a little solution for America with the debt crisis, release debts. That's what they did in Israel. After every 50 years, the year of Jubilee, everybody was released from their debt. That's kind of like what you call bankruptcy court. Because you know why God did that? He didn't want his people enslaved to, they didn't want to be enslaved to each other or another country. God wanted to free people. He delivered them from Egypt, the slavery of Egypt to be freemen, to serve him, to be slaves of his. So slavery, when you think of slavery, don't think of what, uh, and, and when we look at this book and we talk about slaves in Philemon or anywhere in the New Testament, as we'll see next week, don't think of it as the same type of slavery that was in America not too long ago. Totally different type of thing altogether. Totally different. And they would, again, they wouldn't sit there and go, oh, this is a major social problem. 
That they weren't thinking that way. Paul never tells, and we'll see this next week, he never tells Christian masters to free their slaves. And there was a reason why. He didn't think slavery was the big problem. You know what he thought? He, slavery to other men wasn't the huge problem. The biggest problem was slavery to sin and Satan. See, Paul knew that the gospel, it, what happened was, and this is, we'll see this in Philemon, that when you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, let's take, you got a Christian master like Philemon. He believes in Jesus Christ. He's a believer. He's in the family of God. A Christian slave, totally different, different areas of life, social standing. And he believes, or she believes. Then what happens is it says in Galatians 3, 26 through 28, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave or free man. There's neither male nor female. All are equal in Christ. What the gospel does, it destroys. It destroys all these racial, social, and economic, and gender distinction, uh, gender uh, uh, roles, uh, gender distinctions, not roles, but gender distinctions, in the church. That means everybody, whether you were a Christian slave owner or a Christian slave, you had equal privilege and equal opportunity to glorify God. So we have to look at that from God's perspective. Paul was looking at it from God's perspective. Sin and Satan is the big problem. I want to make people slaves of Jesus Christ, servants of Jesus Christ, and only the gospel can do that. See, being a servant and slave of God is not to a cruel, tyrannical, tyrannical ruler. It's to a loving, caring God who is so willing, who loves us so much that he was willing to send his son to the cross for us when we were yet his enemies. Okay? So when serving and being a slave to God and Jesus Christ is not terrible. It's the greatest thing in the world. We're either a slave to him or a slave to sin and Satan. God, Paul looked at the world that way. That's the way we need to. So the problem wasn't slavery. The problem was sin and Satan. So what happened, as we'll see in this book, that being in the family of God now requires you to operate a certain way. Christian slave master, Christian slave. Uh, we see, we'll see next week that the slave was, had certain uh, responsibilities. Uh, the, uh, the, the Christian slave master had certain responsibility. What was that? Treat each other the way you'd want to be treater, treated. You had to operate in love in the family of God. So what we see is in Israel, for instance, Slavery was not a big, the problem was in slave, with Israel, God didn't want, he was not saying don't make slaves of people, what he's saying, don't mistreat people. So if you're a Christian slave owner, you couldn't mistreat your slave, you got to treat them as a brother and sister in Christ if they're a Christian. Or just like you would anybody else, do unto others as you would have done unto you. So what happened was, the gospel gave us the, uh, the, uh, the code of conduct called love, God's love, we're to operate in God's love toward each other, and therefore, that took care of the problems of any abuse by Christian sla slave owners of their Christian slaves, because they were required Christian slave masters to treat their, their, uh, their people under them, their slaves, with love. So, Christianity is superior, this is one of the manifestations that Christianity is totally superior to all the religions of the world. There's nothing like the gospel. There's nothing like the gospel, the word of God. So this morning, we're going to study the subject of slavery in the first century AD, which will in turn help us to understand this little book in the New Testament called Paul's letter to Philemon. So it's going to help us to understand this letter since Paul is writing to a Christian slave owner regarding one of his runaway slaves who became a Christian through Paul's ministry. And by Roman law, this runaway, Onesimus, could be severely treated. He could even be killed. He had no, what's interesting, and under Roman law, the Christian slave had no rights at all. None. So it was up to the benevolence of the owner, how, you know, whatever he wanted to do, it was up to him what, how he wanted to treat him. And some mistreated, uh, uh, punished him severely. Paul's not asking for that. In fact, Paul's saying, he's a believer now. I want you to welcome into, him into the fellowship of your home. Philemon had a home, a, a house, a church in his house. Archippus was the pastor, just like Titus has, and Jody opened up their home. They had a house church, and he's saying, welcome your runaway slave into the fellowship of the church because now he is totally, fundamentally different than he was prior to running away. He's now your spiritual brother, and treat him accordingly. So it says in Philemon 1, 
We'll read right through this letter again, like we did last week. Verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Early church met in church uh, homes like this, like in Titus and Jody's place. They didn't meet, they didn't be, uh, meet in these big buildings they have today. They don't. And I think I, I will say this, I think too many churches are spending way, way too much money on buildings rather than on God's people and God's work. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you, Philemon, for Christ's sake. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. He, he opened up his home to the, to the body of Christ. Therefore, though I, I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, because he had apostolic authority, he could do that. He had that authority. Yet, for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, the age, that means he's an elder, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus. When he says my child, he means my spiritual child, not his child in the natural realm. He got saved through Paul's ministry when Paul was under house arrest in Rome, waiting his appeal before Caesar, as we saw in Acts 28. So he describes Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, got saved through my ministry, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and me. It's a play on uh, uh, Onesimus' name there. So he's saying he used to be useless, now he's not. In fact, he's very useful for me. He's helping me out in Rome. So he says, I, verse 12, I have sent him back to you in person that is sending my very heart. And remember, Tychicus would be carrying this letter, Philemon, and, Fi and Onesimus would be accompanying him. And also the letter to the Colossians, because Philemon lived in Colossae. So the both letters went together. In fact, if you go and try to pick up a commentary on Philemon, it's usually together with F Colossians, because they were, they were delivered together. The same people as we saw last week who were, appear in the greeting, or the, uh, the, uh, ben near the end of the letter, the closing part of the letter, same people there in Philemon appear in uh, Colossians too. So, th so then it says in verse 12, I have sent him back to you in person, that is sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything, so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was for this reason depart uh, se separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you regard me as a partner, and the first class condition says, and we agree that we are partners, accept him as you would me. Accept means welcome, into the, help, welcome him into the fellowship of your home. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. If he's ripped you off in any way, I'll take care of it. Not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. That means Philemon gets saved through Paul's ministry as well. So Philemon owes his salvation to Paul in the sense, not, I mean, obviously it's from God, but Paul, God used Paul to save Philemon, lead him to the Lord. Look at verse 20. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ by welcoming Onesimus back, thus forgiving him. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I say, maybe possibly even free him, at that, to serve Paul, because Paul wanted him in Rome to help him out. At, that same at the same time, also, prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. He's saying, I want to visit you guys. Verse 23, Epiphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. We saw a lot of these people in Romans too, Romans 16. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now, there were, by some accounts, up to 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. 
So Onesimus was one of those 60 million slaves that were in the Roman Empire in the first century. And many of these slaves became Christians and fellowshiped and the local assemblies with their masters. Now, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia defines slavery as the following, and I'm quoting from them. The voluntary or involuntary servitude to an individual, the state or temple, that entails reduction of legal status and social status to the level of property. So, in the first century of the Roman Empire, I mentioned to you many of the differences between slavery in the, in the ancient world and slavery in America in the 1800s or 1700s, okay? That being the case, though there were a lot more advantages of slavery in the ancient world, they still didn't have any right, well, especially in the Roman Empire, they had absolutely no rights. They were nothing but property. Now, there were many ways in which, in which one became a slave in the ancient world. One is you were captured in war. The First and Second Punic Wars of, the Roman, of Rome, of the Republic of Rome, they ended up being a principate later on uh, with Augustus, uh, Caesar, but they, what they did is they captured these people and they brought them, and a lot of these people were professional, and they, they basically used it, used these people, professional peoples, and, and uh, you know, pro uh, productive slaves who worked out in the fields and stuff. They used these people, they benefited the Roman Empire's economy. It was a, a great boon to their economy. You had this type of labor. And we, we do this in America. We go, to, we go overseas to get our, our people uh, to uh, work for dirt cheap in like Pakistan and India and whatnot. We, we kind of do the same thing as the Roman Empire does. So there were many ways in which one became a slave in the ancient world. One was capture and war. Two, kidnapping on slave raiding or piracy expeditions. Three, one was an offspring of a slave. Four, punishment for crimes or debt. If you committed a crime... You could, be, uh, uh, put, brought, uh, you could be put into slavery. If you had big times with problems with debt, well, to pay off that, you went into slavery. You had to pay off the debt. You worked, for, uh, worked to get rid of the, uh, the debt. Now, also, number five, you could be sold into slavery by parents, relatives, or spouses. Now, before you get all worked up about that and thinking about you want to sell your kid into slavery, like you, that would be a good idea. You know, one of the things that they would do, if you wanted to advance socially, like go up the social ladder, you could say, you know what? My kids, in this, where I am, let's say you were, de you were not in a very good situation in the ancient world. You could say, you know what? I'm in, my kid's going to be, I'm not going to, I don't have much skills. I'm not going to be able to give my, much of a, a, a head start to my kids. You know what I'll do? I'll sell them into slavery to this very rich, wealthy uh, person who in politics or whatnot, a great, per a big, uh, you know, in the Roman Empire, and maybe they'll, if they accept it, then they'll be brought up in a home where they'll get the best of everything being his slave. See what they did? So it wasn't an evil. A, 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 in fact, they wouldn't call it an evil because it, it could help you socially. You could help your kids. Your kid was going nowhere. And then you could say, hey, I'm going to sell him into slavery. He could go into that home, possibly, and he'll probably get trained to skill if he was really young. And he could educate it in everything under this rich person's home. They did that a lot, people. Okay, that's a lot different than the slavery that was in America years ago. Now, also, it's interesting, uh, people went into slavery to, to escape starvation. Do you know that sometimes being a free person in the Roman Empire, you starved? Whereas sometimes if, when you were a slave for somebody and under a wealthy person, you ate well, you were treated well. In the first century, you could, many people who were free they had a terrible time of it. They lived, they were in the poverty level. Whereas a slave would, would have a higher, higher income and everything. Better situation all around. Also, you could go into slavery to self-sale, to escape destitution, or as I said before, to gain an elite position in society. So let's say you were a, a, an orphan. And you could say, you had no mother and father, and you're around 18, 19 years old. You could say, you know what? I'm going to go sell myself into slavery. I'm going to approach this wealthy man and see if I can get, enter his household and he can give me an education and everything and he could benefit from my service for him and I could benefit from what he could give me. So it was a win-win situation many times. So the first, what's interesting, the first known major society where there were slaves was in Athens, Greece. Now that's ironic because if you read anything about history, the Athenians, where we get our you know, democracy from, idea of democracy, the Athenians were known for their strident views on personal freedom. 
Yet they're the ones that came up with the idea of slavery, uh, uh, really uh, propagated the idea of slavery and benefited from its slavery. Now the nation of Israel was commanded by the Lord God to make slaves of those whom they conquered in battle. Uh, there were five ways in which you could become a slave in Israel. Uh, one, those who sold themselves into slavery because of a debt. We know that's the same as another, uh, like Rome and, and Greece. Number two, uh, people who were prisoners of war. That's another way you became a slave in Israel. Those who were born into slavery, just like in other, other parts of the world in that time. Those who were sold into slavery, like Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery. And where did Joseph end up? Remember? He went into Egypt, but who was he, who was he under? Potiphar. Potiphar was, Potiphar was a, a tremendous, a wealthy man in Pharaoh's house. He, ran, he was a big shot in Pharaoh's government. Joseph hit it. See, Joseph didn't go out in the field and was picking cotton. Joseph was, Joseph was so skilled in what he did, he, was, he had all of Potiphar's house. Potiphar was one of the uh, upstanding, uh, most um, prominent individuals in Egyptian society. And, pa and Joseph was his slave. And God blessed him in, in his slavery. Then, number five, in Israel, you could go into slavery if you were caught committing the crime of breaking and entering. Remember we studied in Exodus 22, verses 2 and 3? If you were caught breaking and entering in, entering somebody's house, you entered into slavery. Now that's what we should do. We'll clean up all these prisons and everything. Stop dropping trillions of dollars into prisons and prisoners. Stop bringing back death penalty. Get rid of those who are be guilty of, of uh, capital crimes. And then these breaking and entering and all this other stuff, let's make, let's make them pay off their debt to society. Let them make them pay off the debt of the person they ripped off. And stuff like that. That's we should be going back to some of these things in the ancient world instead of putting them in a prison, which and I consider. I mean, if you know anything about prisons, it's a bad scene. They don't come out better; they come out worse, especially if they're, and they're in with hardened criminals. They get into gangs, they get into drugs. We need to do something about that. Otherwise, it's going to be it's going to blow up in our faces. It's already doing it now. Now, the rights of slaves in Israel, I, and I met, touched on this before as well. It included the privilege of having observing the Sabbath with the rest of Israel and also the Passover celebration. In fact, it, God told Israel, if you have slaves in your home, like he told us with Abraham, everybody who's a slave in your home, you circumcise them. They could, what's interesting, they could, enter in, they could be a part of the covenant people of God as slaves, and many were, that weren't ra Jewish racially. Remember, there was, a, there was a lot of people that came into Israel that were not Jewish racially, but they, they could take part in the covenant, like in Abraham's house, he had everybody as slaves who were Gentiles become uh, part of the covenant people of God. And, and they had to uh, uh, exhibit to the right of circumcision, which was a sign that they had ex exercised faith in the Lord and trusted in his promises. Hebrew slaves were also, and I touched on this briefly too, Hebrew slaves were to be freed after six years of service. That's Exodus chapter 21, verses 1 through 4 we studied, and Deuteronomy 15, 12 through 18 teaches this as well. A slave could remain a perpetual slave if the slave chose to do so. Why would he do that? See, and if we look at slavery from our, our perspective in America, uh, we can't understand this at all. This is insane. But as I said before, you have a be if you're in a, a, in a wealthy home and you're educated and you're getting a good salary, I mean, you're getting money, you're pay getting paid a good salary, you might want to stay with this guy for the rest of your life. There's nothing wrong. That's nothing wrong with that. So it was a good, that's why some people would say, I want to be this slave forever. And the other thing is, you know, some people are better off being, t some people, and we see it in our country, you know, they, they're better off under somebody else's authority and being taken care of. Some people can't take care of themselves. They're so soft. And we see that in our country. We all the welfare and everything. People can't do any, some people are just, whether they're lazy or whatnot, you know, in, in the Roman Empire, that problem wouldn't exist. You'd be, you'd, uh, you'd be somebody's slave and you'd be told what to do. And, and some people, that's what they need. Not all. Now, all Hebrew slaves, which is interesting, and I touched on it again this as well, every 50th year in Israel, the year of Jubilee, regardless of the length of their work as slaves, all Hebrew slaves were to be manumitted, set free. What is manumission or manumitted? What do I mean by that? M-A-N-U-M-I-S-S-I-O-N, -S -S manumission. Well, what is that? That's the act. It's very simple. It's the act or process of releasing someone from slavery. So when I talk about uh, manumission or manumitting a slave, 
I'm talking about freeing him, setting them free. That's the technical term that is used. Now, slaves could be manumitted by redemption, by the elapse of time, as we noted in Israel, six years, the year of Jubilee, every 50 years, every 50 years, physical disability, Exodus 21, verses 26 and 27 says that the person who is a slave of yours has a physical disability, you could set them free. In many instances, they wouldn't want to be set free if they were in a wealthy home. Uh, number five, purchasing one's freedom through the accumulation of personal assets. Leviticus 25, 49 says that a slave in Israel, if he accumulated enough personal assets, he could get his, uh, he could get, uh, he could set, get his own freedom, purchase his own freedom. That's totally different from slavery in America in the 1800s and 1700s and back. You could, you could purchase your own freedom. That means that implies that they got a salary. They got money. You could make money. As I said before, in the ancient world, you could own property. Slavery, when we come to go, when we transition from slavery in Israel to slavery in the Roman Empire, in which, and this is the, the book of Philemon, was written in the context of slavery in the Roman Empire in the first century. Slavery was a major institution in the Roman Empire. From the third century BC onward, slaves flooded into Rome from all quarters as a result of their victories and wars. Some slaves, as I pointed out before, were professional people, they were philosophers. Teachers, artists, architects, they were from all, all types of professions. So they weren't just doing menial tasks. They were very, they could really help somebody out. If you were a wealthy Roman landowner, you, get, you might want a philosopher. You might want a teacher to teach your kids. You wanted to get the best teacher. Let's say you heard about the best teacher, at one of the best teachers in, uh, uh, in Greece, and you wanted to teach your kids about the classics of Greek, Greek literature. You got a guy, you could buy this guy who does this and he's a slave. And you could buy this slave and you could give him a great salary. He'd be tutoring your kids. It'd be a great deal. A great deal for the, the, the slave uh, and the person who was sold into slavery, but also a great deal for your family because they could be, your kids could be educated with these people. So uh, some slaves, again, were professional people. Criminals and the unfortunate in the gladiatorial schools and some worked, uh, some... Uh, People who were criminals in slave, uh, involved in slavery or the unfortunate, they were uh, put, shipped into the gladiatorial schools and some worked the mines and quarries. Now, I don't want to paint a picture that slavery in the ancient world was a piece of cake and it was, it was always easy and there wasn't a bad side to it. It was. But I'm pointing out this good side that most people overlook because in our day and age, we look at it as, as an evil. We actually even call it an evil. In some instances, yeah, if the person is being inhumanely treated, that's evil. That's evil even if they weren't a slave and you were inhumanly treating them. So Roman law stated that the slave had no legal rights. So when Onesimus ran away, he had no legal rights. He was at the mercy of Philemon. And thank God for Onesimus, Philemon knew Paul, and Philemon was a Christian master who knew who operated in the love of God. So Onesimus got a great deal there. So a Roman law stated that the slave had no legal rights since they were considered as property under Roman law. Domestic slaves were often treated as members of the family. So there's a, a slave that worked out in the field, but there were domestic slaves. People, uh, you might, uh, domestic slaves, and we know this from looking at the tombs of these people in the ancient world, and their, the, uh, the things written on their, uh, you know, on their uh, tombstones. Some people, they were, loved their, they were very, uh, very close friends or even married uh, some of their slaves, the slave owners. And some slaves adored their slave masters. Uh, some of them went to war. They went everywhere they went. They were there, loyal, following them wherever they went. That, that, so there were, were tight relationships between slave owners and slaves themselves. Now, family life was not denied the domestic slave. You could have your family. And, many of their and on many of their tombstones, there was written the words of a master who was greatly indebted to them and loved them. So it wasn't all poor treatment of the slave. It was not unusual for slaves to risk their lives to protect their masters. We have accounts of that in the ancient world. And many voluntarily accompanied their masters into exile, and several gave their lives to their masters. Many owners freed their slaves and proceeded to marry them, and some treated them as friends, as, such as Seneca, 
who was a great man in the ancient world. He was a contemporary of the Apostle Paul. He was a philosopher. And many people think that he was, sounds a lot like Paul in a lot of ways, but he, of course he, he, he wasn't uh, uh, governed by the Holy Spirit, of course. The slave was a, being a, a slavery absolutely um, an, uh, enhanced Roman life. It, it, the economy of Rome was bolstered by the slavery uh, population. Slave, uh, the slave contributed greatly to both the economic and social life of the Roman Empire. As I said before, when Rome, you know, Rome was a republic. Rome got big, you know, when Gaius Julius Caesar, when he was assassinated after that, then they became what we call an empire, principate they call it. And one man rule, he, he, he basically, um, he was the top dog and the, and the Senate was subordinate to him in all things. He used the Senate as his tool. Now, what's interesting is that, um, when all these people, these slaves came in from, let's say, Greece and other parts of the world, and they were very philosophers, teachers, that totally transformed the absorption of all these slaves from, like, Greece and whatnot. It totally transformed Roman society. Roman society, because, like, Greek slaves, they were, uh, Roman society became, um, became more, um, let's say, what, what we call it, they were transformed in the sense that they, they're, um, their social life there was changed. Their, they became uh, more um, appreciative of the arts and music and stuff like that and philosophy. It changed their whole, the Roman Empire. Rome was just Italy. Now they became, a, they had a cosmopolitan attitude because of the influx of these slaves, many of whom were teachers and philosophers. So the dress of slaves, as I pointed out before, was no different than the freemen. A slave didn't dress different. So if I was a slave... I didn't dress different than Titus. He, we looked at, we, you would never know who was the slave and who was the slave master in many instances. Now, in the ancient world, since we're talking about, in Philemon, a runaway slave, what about the runaway slave? What was the situation that Onesimus would have found in the, in the first century in the Roman Empire? Being a runaway slave was not a good thing. He was in deep trouble, the runaway slave. In the ancient world, runaway or fugitive slaves were outlaws. And with the exception of great slave revolts, runaway slaves didn't band together. Uh, they didn't go, where's the other, where were these other runaway slaves? They didn't have a hideout where they went. Or they, in some cases, they did. They were, most of the instances, they were on their own. And, and of course, sometimes you had great slave revolts, but that was not the norm in the ancient world. Fugitive slaves, on occasion, did come into contact with a fellow runaway, but in general, fugitive slaves were shunned by people out of fear of the consequences of harboring them. Harboring a fugitive slave was prohibited by Roman law in both the east and west portions of the Roman Empire as they, when they went east and west later on, much later on. So, um, you know, here's Onesimus. He comes into contact with Paul. Now, I, I doubt Paul knew who he was until after the fact. This guy, it, it, wait till we get to that the part of the book. The, what are the odds are the guy goes 900 miles, Onesimus, runs away from his master. Colossae is 900 miles away from uh, Rome. He goes all the way over there, runs away because he can hide in Rome because Rome is a vast city. You can get lost in that. He runs into a guy named Paul. Now, he knows Paul because he, knows, cause Paul know, oh, he knows, knows about Paul through Philemon because Philemon undoubtedly got sa was saved through Paul's ministry, talked about Paul. He had a church in his house, so, and they read Paul's letters in, in Philemon's church, in his home. What are the odds of Onesimus running into Paul in Rome? Vast city like that. That's called the providence of God. It was no accident. It wasn't chance but fate. He ran into the one guy of all the guys to run into in Rome, and he evangelized him, and he gets saved. And then I'm sure Paul found out about this guy, wh who he was, and said, wow, God led you to me, you know. <laughs> and then he sends him back. And uh, patches up the whole thing with his uh, his slave master. So uh, runaways. Well, if you were a runaway like Onesimus, what were your options? Well, runaways did have options in that they could join bandits. You don't want to really do that, but some did. They uh, they could attempt to disappear or mix in with the people of great seaport cities or large cities such as Rome, Corinth, and Ephesus. Like I said before, Onesimus. Pro you know, a lot of people say, why would Onesimus go 900 miles to Rome? Why didn't he go somewhere shorter distance like Ephesus? That's a big city as well. Well, for two reasons. Rome was a bigger city, and it was further away from his slave master. 
So if he wanted to uh, make sure he could get away for good, that's what you would do. Rome, it makes sense that he would go to Rome and travel that such far distance. Uh, there were many reasons why a slave could, would flee his master. Why would somebody, why would Onesimus, and we don't know, and this is kind of interesting, I'm wondering why Onesimus did flee Philemon. I doubt it was from physical abuse, though that's a possibility. I just doubt that that was the case here because of his, his, uh, his, the doctrine Philemon had. There were many reasons why a slave like Onesimus would flee his master in the first century. Uh, one, he or she might have been cruelly treated by their master, or they could have been victims of torture or maimed by their owner. There are cases of that being taking place in the first century. They also could have desired to return to their homeland. They wanted to go back to their homeland. That could have been a reason. Also, the fugitive slave would make every attempt to distance himself from his master. Even if they did depart the province in which their master lived, the fugitive, the runaway slave, had no assurance that they would not be caught and severely punished. The runaway's name, the runaway's name, his accent, his language, his conduct could betray, betray him and cause them to be cause him not to be accepted by the local population. So let's say I'm a runaway slave from Massachusetts. All right, I come to Iowa. You talk kind of funny. Here I am walking into town. Who's this guy? And boy, he's got a funny accent. Well, that would just that would cause people to shun you. Okay, you have a different dialect, different language, and maybe people suspect that you might be a runaway, and then they get it, they, send, they call the local police in on the thing to check you out, and sure enough, you're a runaway slave. So your accent, like my accent, would be, would be something would be work against me if I went to some place uh, that was rural, definitely. But city, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be as much as of a problem. Now, they were often, you know, it's interesting, with runaway slaves, they were often hungry, and they would be exposed to the elements, when they were runaways. Furthermore, the fugitive or the runaway's wa wages, if he could find a job, would be below the minimum wage because of the many unemployed free persons and freed men who lived in poverty in the empire. Now, don't miss what I just said there. I, I pointed out earlier. A lot of people who were free in the Roman Empire, they lived in poverty. Whereas the slaves, many slaves, were, had a great salary and had a higher standard of living. That's a fact we know. So, when you ran away from your master and now you're, you're trying to live among free people, you're, you're going to go into poverty. You're going to go into poverty. And so that's what happened. So the, they lost their, they took a huge pay cut, many of them, if they ran away from their master. They'd end up being no, be, no better than the, the poor, destitute, poverty-stricken, free Roman people uh, in, in, in a city. So a fugitive... What all, and the other thing, the other drawback of being a, run, of being a runaway is you were hunted. Uh, a fugitive would always feel hunted or either by his master, the state or local police, or professional slave catchers. And, uh, and they would always be worried about capture. So you got your master, if he has a, a, big, a lot of means, he could get, get somebody, hire somebody. There were the local police. Uh, there were uh, state police. There were also professional slave catchers, you know, like bounty hunters. You know, they'd be out there looking for you, trying to make some money. So you always felt hunted. So Onesimus, undoubtedly, was, you know, was stressed out for sure. Despite these precarious circumstances, there were a couple of ways in which a, the fugitive's flight could be successful. First of all, they and, and this is what happens with Onesimus. They could seek asylum in the house of a free person or who had an outstanding reputation in the local community, or they could find asylum in the environs of a temple. Like, in the ancient world, you could go to a temple, and the priest in the temple, in a pagan temple, could be your intermediary and protect you, give you protection, feed you, clothe you, and work it out with your, your, the, the master you ran away from. He could patch things up. That was a common thing that took place in the ancient world. Uh, so these two options are related to the situation with Onesimus in Paul's epistle. Remember, Paul is a Roman citizen by birth. He didn't purchase his citizenship. He was a Roman citizen. So Paul was a, this was a perfect situation for Onesimus, not just because Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ, but also Paul was a Roman citizen. And, and, and Paul was not a poor person. Paul had, came from means. He was, a Pharisee. he was a Pharisee from Pharisees. They had money. They were very wealthy. So Paul, you know, he knew wealthy people and he was from a wealthy home himself. He had means. So he's a Roman citizen by birth and therefore 
Onesimus running into him was the perfect situation. Onesimus, Paul could help Onesimus out, and he did. If a fugitive slave decided to return to his master voluntarily because of the hardship they endured while on the run or as a result of capture, their fate was entirely up to the master. The master could decide to whip them. Uh, he could, they could be beaten till, until they're crippled. Sometimes they were branded on their arms or head or the skin under their feet might be burned off by glowing iron plates. It's all, some masters did this. A metal collar with their name and address might be fixed around their neck like a dog here in the 21st century, and they could even be killed by their owner as an example for the rest of the slaves to, fo- to, to watch. Don't mess with me, I'll kill you. This is what I'm going to do. So he, if he was a cruel guy, this could happen. If the slave owner decided to sell the fugitive slave, they would have to guarantee the buyer for a particular point of, a period of time that the slave would not run away. Now, however, if the fugitive slave had in fact found refuge with a benevolent and wealthy or high-standing friend of their master's house, which was the case with Paul and Onesimus, and was voluntarily returning, carrying or or turned carrying an intercessory letter, there was a distinct possibility of a gracious and kind reception by the owner. So again, you ran into someone like Paul, and you asked Paul, Paul, I need you to help me. I ran away from my master, blah, 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 and Paul could say, okay, I'll intercede for you. I'll help you out in this matter. And then there was a letter that had to be sent to the, the, uh, to the slave, uh, the master, on behalf of the slave. And that's exactly what the letter of Philemon is all about. So this example, again, is found in Paul's epistle to Philemon where he interceded on behalf of Philemon's runaway slave. Now, as we come near the end here, uh, we're going to talk about the rest of the class about manumission. We don't have much time. In the Roman Empire, the only legal avenue available to, to a slave to pursue his freedom was manumission, setting, a free, setting getting uh, set free. Legal manumission could come about when the existence of a city or state was threatened by a foreign army. Foreign army. So if a foreign army was hitting your city, your master could say, you're free. <laughs> I'll give you your freedom if you fight against this army. So that happened. Uh, legal emancipation of a slave took place in the master's home according to family and private rights, but state and corporation laws in the ancient world and the Roman Empire required official ceremony. So if there was going to be, if, if Philemon decided eventually to Uh, free Onesimus, which I believe he did. Uh, If he did, it was a ceremony in the guy's home when it it took place. Now, during the days of the Apostle Paul in the first century, the safest way to grant and receive freedom was either by testament or by a letter. Now, this letter had to have a proper formula, meaning that the the wording could not be, I wish to be free, but rather so-and-so is free, and I order that he be free. So this is kind of... So Paul... You notice he says, I don't order you, Philemon, to free uh, to welcome into your home. I don't even order you to free him. I have that authority to do any of those things. But I'm not going to do that. I leave it up to you to do that. So Paul is very, takes a very um, respectful tone with Philemon because he wants Philemon to operate in love toward Onesimus and welcome him into his home. And remember he says in verse 22, and I know you'll do much more than I even ask. And that's implying free him. And I'd free him so he can come and serve me, Paul says. But I didn't keep him because I want you, to, I want you of your own volition, Philemon, to, set him, uh, to, uh, to welcome him into your, the fellowship of the church in your home and free him. You know, by implication, he's saying that. So as we close here, this whole, this whole situation with Philemon and Onesimus and Paul, it's, uh, the whole situation where, is rooted in Christian redemption. The Apostle Paul's appeal in his epistle to Philemon with regards to his slave Onesimus is based upon the understanding of the doctrine of redemption as revealed in the Old Testament scriptures as well as the revelation Paul received from the Holy Spirit regarding the redemption accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ. Redemption means that Jesus Christ, through God the Father, through Jesus Christ his Son, redeemed us all out of the slave market of sin, which we were all born, we were physically alive, yet spiritually dead, enslaved to sin and Satan. Remember Jesus said in John 8, you're all slaves of sin. We're free men. No, you're slaves of sin. So Jesus Christ came and died on the cross to set us free. He purchased our freedom. Actually, he purchased us out of the slave market of sin and Satan so that we could serve God. He, he purchased us so we could be slaves of his. And... So what? How did so? What God? What Paul's going to is telling 
uh, teaching Philemon or he's intimating to Philemon. He's saying, in the same way God freed you, Philemon, from sin and Satan through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, and he treated you in love and forgave you and, and uh, was uh, kind and compassionate to you, even though you were his enemy. That's how I want you to treat Philemon, uh, to treat Onesimus. In fact, that's how we're to treat each other. Regardless of social status, Christians should be, should be treating each other in love and grace and forgiveness and not vilifying or backstabbing or ju uh, judging or uh, 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 being um, uh, you know, viciously hurting, trying to hurt another Christian. It should never happen because God through Christ has forgiven us and we're obligated. It's not a choice. We're obligated to love each other and love each other means pray for each other, forgive each other, be patient and tolerant with one another, put the other person ahead of ourselves. See, that the, the relationship that Philemon and Onesimus have has through Jesus, faith in Jesus Christ has transformed their relationship of slave, slave, master. Don't, don't miss what I said. The relationship of slave and slave master that Onesimus and Philemon had was transformed by both of them becoming Christians. Because now, the, the, the standard by which they had to treat each other is much higher than it was before they both became Christians. Now, they have to, they're obligated to treat each other as God and Christ has treated them. They have to follow the royal family honor code. Love. Not the, not the, uh, the mushy, sentimental love that we have, uh, people call God's love, and it's not. In Christianity. It's produced by the Holy Spirit. It's a response to what God has done to us through Christ and the Holy Spirit. Forgiving us. Raising us up and seating us with Christ. Treating us in grace better than we deserve. That's where, that is now our standard of conduct. That's how God operates toward us. That's where we to operate toward each other. And that's what Philemon is to do with Onesimus. Everything has changed now. Everything has changed. The Spirit reminded Israel in the Old Testament that they were slaves in Egypt. When we study that in Exodus, and yet God delivered them from this cruel bondage. It's interesting. If you look at what God talks in the Old Testament to Israel, he always tells them, do not mistreat foreigners, don't mistreat slaves. Because you once were slaves and foreigners in Egypt. That's, this is a principle in our spiritual life. Woe to us Christians if we don't treat our fellow, our fellow Christians in love and grace and forgiveness when God has done that for us. Remember Jesus said, if you don't forgive, you're not forgiven. He's talking about his disciples who are already in the family of God. He means you're, not, you're out of fellowship is what he's saying. Don't think you're in fellowship with God. You're not. God's not having fellowship with you. And remember, if you confess, if, let's say, uh, let's say um, somebody does something wrong to me and I don't forgive that person. You know, like Cheyenne slashes my tires. I don't know why she would do that, but she, if let's say she's, and I don't forgive her of it, then God hasn't forgiven me. I'm out of fellowship. I'm required to forgive her. Please don't slash my tires. Take all knives away from her. So anyways, we're obligated. It's only right. It's just that we do treat each other the way God has treated us. That's what's going on with Paul, telling what Paul's trying to tell Philemon and uh, uh, in his relationship to Onesimus, to welcome him back into the fellowship of his, to welcome, to fi for Philemon, to welcome um, Onesimus back into his home is going to be a test, but, okay? Because he, he, I don't, it doesn't say exactly, but he could have ripped, you know, cost them some money. So here we, he's got a, he's got a, now he's got a big test here. And, you know, if you notice earlier in the letter, Paul says to Philemon, he acknowledged Philemon's operating in love uh, in the, with the body of Christ. That same love, Philemon, I want you to exercise now toward Onesimus. He's now your spiritual brother. Love him with that Christian love that I've taught you about, that you've operated in now. You're all brothers now. The relationship is transformed. You're no longer slave, slave master. You're more than that, he said. So redemption refers to that aspect of Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross that purchased all of humanity out of the slave market of sin and it's appropriated through the non-meritorious decision to believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. The doctrine of redemption refers to the fact that Jesus Christ's spiritual and physical deaths on the cross were a substitutionary ransom 
for the benefit of each and every member of the human race. These unique substitutionary deaths redeem the entire human race out from the slave market of sin in which each one of us was born physically alive yet spiritually dead. There are many references in the, uh, the New Testament to the Lord Jesus Christ purchasing uh, the entire human race out of the slave market of sin by means of his voluntary, substitutionary, spiritual and physical deaths on the cross. Mark 10, 45, Matthew 20, 28, Romans 3, 24, 1 Corinthians 1, 30, 6, 27, 23, Galatians 3, 13 and 14, and Galatians 4, verses 4, uh, chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, Ephesians 1 through 7, just to name a few. And there's Colossians 1, 13 and 14 as well. And we've run out of time. I, we're going to have to close it here. We'll run, run long. So let's, uh, let's, let's take a moment uh, to close in prayer here. Father, we just thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you for this uh, things that we've learned, and we pray that uh, the Holy Spirit would use these things and help us to get a, gain a greater appreciation of the book of Philemon and also our relationship with you. We thank you for redeeming us from slavery to sin and Satan so that we can serve you. We thank you for the freedom that you've given us, true freedom. Help us all to understand, Father, through the power of the Spirit, that true freedom is not living any old way we want to or living in immor immorality. Freedom is to serve you, Father, to, operate, to serve you who loved us and gave yourself, uh, your son up for us when we were yet your enemies. So help us treat each other as you've treated us in grace and love and forgiveness, compassionate, uh, compassion. We just pray, Father, that you would help us all to function according to your royal family honor code so that we might bring glory to you. So, Father, we thank you for redeeming us from the slave market of sin and raising us up and seating us with your son, Jesus Christ, making your sons, entering into your household in which we will be forever. And we are eternally grateful to you, Father. Help us to be greater servants for you and, and, and love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our fellow believer as your son, Jesus Christ, has loved us. So, Father, we pray for these people and things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're going to uh, take up a Sunday morning offering. And uh, the song I want to do is uh, toward the end of your songbooks. It's called uh, You Are My Savior. And that's uh, page 199 in your songbooks toward the end. All right, let's pray for this offering. Father, we just thank you for this time to give. We thank you for those who will take part in the giving. And we pray that they'll be blessed by the giving because your son taught it's more blessed to give than receive. We pray that it would produce many thanksgiving to you and your son, Jesus Christ, and would meet our needs. And we thank you for your faithfulness to us and the people who are supporting this ministry, not only with their giving, but also their prayers as well in their service. So, Father, we pray for this offering in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oops. Almost forgot. Thinking back to another day When I was young and tried to do things my own way I was lost so helpless, spinning out of control But you rescued me and saved my wretched soul You are my saviour Jesus, my life, my love. You are my Savior, Jesus. I love you so. I love you so. I love you. 
love you, love you Sin and Satan held me captive as a slave No one to help this sinner No one who could save Desperation filled me No answers came my way But you show me mercy And wipe my sins away You are my savior Jesus, my life, my love. You are my Savior, Jesus. I love you so. I love you so for suffering and dying for me. Your cross of pain has now set me free. Thank you, Lord, for paying the price For every sin by your love sacrifice Love was the reason God became a man To save our world Sinners according to God's plan Oh, the wonder of this awesome mystery The cross of Christ has changed the course of history You are my Savior I love you, Jesus My life, my love You are my Savior, Jesus Jesus, I love you so. You are my Savior, Jesus. I love my love. You are my Savior, Jesus. My love, my love. You are my Savior, Jesus. I love you so. I love you so. Dismissed.